So let's just start out. Why don't you introduce yourself and then also um, tell how you came to Prescott and how long you've been here and, and why you came. Well, then, thanks for, for having me. Um, let me see, I came to Prescott a little over 15 years ago. Uh, well, I wish I could say I came over here for some fabulous book deal or something like that. The fact of the matter is I came here uh, because of a divorce and uh, chance to start over uh, and loved every minute. I'm a big, big outside person, loved to ride a bicycle. And with this weather, the wonderful roads to ride a bicycle, I ain't never leaving. So <laughs> that's how I ended up here. Well, you know, Prescott was just named the best destination in Arizona for nature lovers to come to. So I guess you discovered that early. I sure did. <laughs> uh, well, actually, uh, what was really funny, uh, my first weekend here is um, I went to a friend, well, it was a friend's house, and I'll tell you what, I was a little scared because the only thing they talked about was the samples they had at Costco. And I was like, oh my gosh, if this is what people do for fun, I think maybe I'm in the wrong tale. So um, luckily I was on my bike by Monday and everything was all good. So, um, and now you're running for mayor. Yes. And why don't you talk about uh, why you're running and, and why you think you'll be a good candidate and some of the topics that are important to you. Well, I've actually, uh, from my perspective, I've been working for years behind the scenes on the issues that I think have been really critical to the town. And that's, uh, for number one, was the structured silver home issue and, of course, public pensions. For people who know me, um, I work very hard with Representative Noel Campbell on that. I actually drafted the preliminary legislation for that. But I also built up a really good rapport um, with the owners, CEOs, and also a lot of the kids um, who were in the homes and the, the managers. And that's how we got such a good, um, I think, bill passed and how we got actual buying, as I call it, um, that they actually drove down to the Capitol and testified in support of that. And I think uh, it, it showed because at this point, I think uh, there was uh, numbers that varied, but at one point over 175 homes, and now there's about 45 homes in the city. And I think that's a testament to um, a good piece of legislation and good ordinances. And uh, I'm proud of the work that a whole bunch of people did. And as far as public pensions, um, I started working on this issue when uh, Harry Oberg was running for mayor. And I'll tell you the first article I did for the Carrier and for your for you for Prescott e News, it took uh, 80 hours of research just to write my first article, and uh, I was shocked that I felt like no one was talking about this topic, and um, and I really never stopped researching this topic for, for over two years now, and I'm just uh, frightened that in I spend a lot of time down the Capitol and. I can tell you that the legislators, and these are the people that actually vote on it, they know virtually next to nothing on it. And, uh, and I can see that's kind of the problem is how we got into it. I mean, it's created in 1968, but the legislature piles benefit after benefit. And unfortunately, there's really been no way for the cities, fire districts, and the counties to pay for these benefits. And now I think um, that's kind of where the city of Prescott and all these municipalities and fire districts and it's kind of coming home to roost, the chickens coming home to roost, so to speak. And so what would you be able to do about this as a mayor rather than as a legislator? Well, I think the only true reform is going to come mm -hmm. through the legislature, but here's the deal with this. The legislature is not going to act unless the pressure comes from the bottom up because they haven't done anything about it. Uh, they think Prop 124 solved it, and it did not. Um, it does nothing to address the existing liabilities, which continue to grow every day. And, um, and I think that uh, the people uh, are starting to understand. Right now, I'm actually traveling around the state, educating uh, different councils, mayors, boards of supervisors, and actually legislators on the gravity of this situation. I put together a PowerPoint legislation, a uh, PowerPoint presentation, which is actually a culmination of my research. And uh, I think it's going to take a strong mayor to galvanize other mayors. Harry Oberg started this. He has an um, ad hoc committee on, on the mayors, and there's about 15 to 20 that, that are um, on board with him. 
but it, it's going to have to continue. And I think it's only through educating all of them and going down and putting pressure on these legislators to say, look, Prop 124 wasn't a solution for us. And uh, really to continue to put uh, that kind of pressure on them and to say, look, we need help. We can't pay our bills. Um, you have no idea the struggle we do uh, and what we face uh, to um, go through every uh, month to pay these, this PSBRS bill. It's, it's actually a term called service insolvency. We're paying our bills, but it is such a great cost to us. We're having to not even be able to hire police and firefighters. We're making cuts in all these uh, other services across the board, and that's what I mean by service insolvency. So what would you propose be the solution? And it sounds like you think that the solution should come from the grassroots or, or at least from city level towards the legislature to have them help. Is that correct? I do, and, and here's why, and it's because the unions in Phoenix are very powerful, and they put so much pressure on the legislators to be reelected. It's just that simple, and uh, that's why the legislators are very afraid to, to go out in front and, and really to confront what needs to be done. Uh, right now, uh, they have tried to do reforms in the past, and, and it's been struck down by the courts for uh, your listeners that understand the constitutional protection. We tried, uh, the legislature tried to raise the contribution rates for the officers. They were contributing 7.65% of their salary and they tried to raise it to 11.65. Uh, and the court said that was a diminution of their um, benefits. And so it was not back down to 7.65. And so, so long as that uh, pension clause is in the constitution, the officers never have to contribute any more. And these are the kind of things that it, it just can't continue because uh, the cities, and ultimately it means we the taxpayers, keep contributing more and more toward these pension benefits. And I'm not saying in the least that these officers don't deserve their pensions, and they do, but what happens is the math just, just doesn't lie. Um, Doug Ducey doesn't have a printing press, and certainly neither does the city council of, of Prescott. Sooner or later, you really do run out of other people's money that you just can't um, continue to be able to pay these pension benefits. As I said, the legislature uh, voted in these benefits and it just becomes impossible to pay for them. Okay. Um, what are some of the other interests that you have as if you were to win as mayor? Well, uh, that's an excellent point because what my research has showed me is that uh, sales tax can't dig us out of this hole. And the other thing it has shown is the pension board down in Phoenix is not going to invest its way out of the hole. So the key for Prescott is absolutely economic development. Um, on my website, votemarybeth.org, O-R-G, I put together uh, my vision for economic development for Prescott. And I think uh, the airport is pivotal to that because I think we need to get high-tech jobs in here. We have Embry-Riddle, we have Yavapai College, we do have Prescott College, we have uh, so many young people here and that they all leave. And uh, that is the future for Prescott. We, we can't really remain a retirement community. Um, the last recession, if you exclude the roads tax, we lost 23% of our tax revenue. And that is a frightening number. So when the next recession hits, if we're just dependent solely upon sales tax, think, think about what that does when we're um, faced with continuing to pay our pension bill. So we really have to expand the tax base. It's just that simple. So if we bring these high-tech jobs, these are low water use, these are clean jobs, um, we hold on to our best and brightest. This is the vision, and that's why the airport and being able to bring these uh, tech executives here from San Jose, from Austin, and so they can have their satellite companies here. Um, this is pivotal, pivotal to our uh, success. Um, the other thing I talked about was uh, coding jobs. I mean, there are 1.4 million jobs in the next year alone that pay on average $85,000. And Yavapai College doesn't even offer an associate's degree. This is something that we can offer our high school graduates in the area starting now. So this is something we really have to push out of by college. And I think the parents in this area really have to put pressure on the college to do this too. So again, when these tech executives come here, they have a pool of talent right here waiting for them. That's what Bill Gates did. I mean, 
He wanted to start Microsoft. He started these programs right in all those junior colleges um, surrounding Microsoft and why you think they're the tech giant that they are. So, um, why don't you talk about, you mentioned before your, your bike riding and stuff like that. Talk about the outdoors, talk about how you think that the, the area that we live in can help bring more people in um, to live here and to visit here and tourism and that sort of thing. That's a great point because I think economic and, the, and uh, tourism really go hand in hand because when these uh, tech executives come here, they are looking at quality of life because you look at these young kids and you think, what draws them here? Or you talk to the students that are here, they love living here. For the same thing, we love living here. Uh, it is a great place to raise a family. And so we have, what we have here you can't buy, the weather. Um, the trails, uh, the, whether it's kayaking, uh, road bike trails, mountain bike trails, hiking trails. So when, when an executive is making that decision, should I um, re relocate my company here, we have everything that his place uh, doesn't have. We also have low cost housing. So I, I've always said to people, like, all the balls are in the air and I'm just waiting for them all to fall in place. So. If we have a good tourism and we can bring people in and we can bring these executives in and we promote it well, it's, it's there. So we just have to um, promote this better, but I think we really need to uh, educate our young people too so they see, like, wow, look what I have here. I have these really educated kids and we have a great quality of life to offer as well. So it really has, it, it goes hand in hand. And as far as education goes, you know, you can point to Embry Riddle, you can point to Young Pike College, you can point to Prescott College, and then there's um, the online university sure. out there. Um, and each one of those areas um, or those those institutions brings something different to the table for for students and, and bring a, a wide variety of opportunities. Absolutely, because not all those education uh, opportunities fit each student. And that actually brings entrepreneurial spirit because you have someone that comes in here that might not fit into Every Riddle, but that would fit into Prescott College or would fit into Yavapai College, and and that's what um, that's what starts everything. This this one uh, student that might go to that one college has an idea for an app or has an idea for uh, some certain kind of project, and that's why the incubation center um, that. Um, we talk about at Embry-Riddle. This is the kind of thing I want to appeal to the alumni at Embry-Riddle and appeal to our uh, business community. Let's start this. Let's um, let's have a buy-in from our community. Um, let's, uh, you know, you believe in our community. Outside investors do need to see this buy-in from our community. So um, you, you've, uh, especially our, our, our developers and our business community, you've received a lot from our community. So I'd like you to give back to our community this way and now invest in our incubation center so we can get more outside investment because once they see that I think outside investors are like wow this community is really invested here and it's easy for them to buy in as well if our own community is really bought into it. Right now today and tomorrow um, there's a hundred CEOs yep. of Arizona Absolutely. Technical Companies right here holding a retreat um, up at the resort and they're in put in a little golf too, I think, so. Uh, absolutely, and, and, and when they see um, our people, the, uh, the adults in the room, so to speak, really investing in our kids and believing in our kids, how, how do they not, how, that's contagious, and so they think, well, the, this is a, gr a great place, and why wouldn't I want to bring a satellite office of my uh, company here? And I, you know, I see how this is done in Austin. The retirees are living side by side about with these tech companies, and that's my vision for Prescott. Let's talk about the rodeo because the rodeo's topic has been, you know, kind of floating around a little bit. What do you think about the rodeo and, and the investment that the city has made in the rodeo grounds, and um, and the tourism it brings to this community? Well, it's it's a no-brainer. It, it it does bring in huge revenue. I think it's an important part of our heritage. Um, it absolutely has to continue. I think it is uh, also important uh, to, to really look at some other ways to use the grounds uh, other times during the year. I, I think that is an excellent idea that's been floated around. So you're right, um, if we have uh, 
it just sits there vacant. It, it's certainly uh, other ways. Uh, it, it's, it's a shame to let uh, those grounds go vacant so much of the year. And of course the fairgrounds has come back to Prescott now. It was in another locale remember, for a few years. but Yeah, that was a, that grill got off like a lead balloon, didn't it? it? Yeah, so, but it's back now and um, it seems like it's growing over the last two years and I think it'll continue to be here and, and grow some more, so. Right, right, these are all these things that I think, uh, what makes Prescott Prescott, a again, the tourism dollars, these are all these things, like I said, it, the economic development and tourism really do go hand in hand. Uh, the, you know, at the risk of repeating myself, it's all these things that, that is the quality of life that makes this town such a great town to live in and what makes um, people want to come here and stay here. Uh, you know, the other thing that's actually really interesting that I haven't heard anybody talk about, so I'm just going to toss it at you, is the, um, the parental involvement like in the high schools and stuff. You go to a Prescott High School game and those bleachers are filled all the time. Um, you go down to when Prescott High School is playing at a school down in Phoenix, and a lot of times Prescott has more kids on their side than the home team does. And so, you know, this community is actually really involved in their kids and in their sports, much more so than sometimes a large city will have. And I think that there's some energy there that you could probably tap into. Well, that's exactly it. That's what makes this community so wonderful. And that's exactly what I talk about, whether it's the business community or the parents, it, it's that whole buy-in. I mean, it is palpable. You go down the square on um, even days when the, there's not a lot of tourists. Or, or it is, I mean, it's so neat. You run in the grocery store, you say hi to people, you know. It's so rare to go into a restaurant and not run into people. And I think um, that's what makes this town so wonderful. And I think everyone wants this town to succeed. And uh, and I think sometimes, maybe with the vitriol with this election, I, it makes me sad uh, because I think you can fall on different sides of, of uh, a proposition. But I don't think we have to paint it as you're a good person or a bad person on what side you fall on the proposition. I think there isn't anyone that doesn't want this city to succeed. And uh, I wish we could just, you know, talk about the issues and, and not make it seem you're a bad person if you don't agree with something. Do you think that the city will will succeed whether Proposition 443 passes or not? <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, we just came in, um, in possession of a memo that shows the city has, uh, it, it fluctuates slightly, but uh, no, $123.5 million in cash and investments. So I, I think I wish the voters kind of knew this a little bit ahead of time that uh, I think that's a huge chunk of change. And I've always said this all along uh, with my uh, study on public pensions, if we were able to put, uh, the only way to truly make a dent on this pension is to, is to put about 50 million down on this pension liability. Putting 10 million down, that really doesn't touch it. But if we were able to put 50 million down on this pension liability, that would, uh, at one felt swoop, that would be able to really knock down uh, the pension liability and to really bring uh, things under control. And with that, I don't think we'd even have to tax uh, our citizens. The Prop 443 wouldn't even be needed. Okay, anything you wanna add? No, I just, uh, I would like people to check out my website. Again, votemarybeth.org. You can read about articles I've written, whether it's been on sober homes, whether it's been on public pensions. You might get an idea uh, on how complicated the system is, but at the same time, not so complicated, and you're more than willing to contact me by phone. I can answer any questions you have for me. Thanks for watching.